Okay, take your Bibles tonight and open them to 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel chapter 18, we are skipping over uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, and all but the last verse of 18. Because... It is Absalom's rebellion against David. And it's the people that helped Absalom, the people that helped David, the people that didn't help David, and on and on until eventually Absalom is... Remember Absalom had long hair? He rode under a tree limb and his hair got caught in the limb and he was hanging by his hair and Joab had him killed as he hung there. And word had gotten back to David that Absalom was dead. There had been David and many, many people had fled Jerusalem have been pursued by Absalom. There have been battles going back and forth during this period of time. Absalom actually it was the enemy of David. He is trying to overthrow the kingdom and become king himself. Now, what we're going to look at tonight, and why I skipped over all that, because it's just simply, like I said, those who helped and those who didn't help, and the battle, some of the battle news that took place there, was the reaction by David to the death of his son Absalom. Remembering that Absalom had been trying to kill David or have him killed so that he could become king instead of his father, David. So stand with me as I begin in verse 33 of chapter 18 and go to verse 8 of chapter 19. Then the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And, he, and as he went, he said thus, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And Joab was told, Behold, the king is weeping a mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard it said that day, The king is grieved for his son. And the people stole back into the city that day as people who are ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. But the king covered his face, and the king cried out with a loud voice, O oh, my son, Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab came into the house to the king and said, Today you have disgraced all your servants, who today have saved your life, the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives, and the lives of your concubines in that you love your enemies and hate your friends. For you have declared today that you regard neither princes nor servants. For today I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all of us had died today, then it would have pleased you well. Now therefore arise, go out and speak comfort to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, not one will stay with you this night. And that will be worse for you than all the evil that has befallen you from your youth until now. Then the king arose and sat in the gate, and they told all the people, saying, There is the king sitting in the gate. So the people came before the king for everyone in Israel or every one of Israel had fled to his tent. Father, I pray tonight that as we look at this passage and the circumstances concerning David and the death of his son Absalom, that we can see the bigger picture 
like David needed to see. And Lord God, that we can be available to you for your work, for your kingdom work. And Lord God, that through that, your kingdom will grow, it will be unified, and that many, many people will come to know Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take a few minutes and look at this tonight. As we think about all that David had been through, David pretty much all of his life from the time of his youth had been chased by some person or another trying to kill him. And Joab points out during this conversation that he's having with him, if he doesn't straighten up, then what's going to happen that night is going to be worse than anything else that had ever happened to David during his entire life. Now what was it that was going on? We've got to look at it and I think maybe we can understand it from David's point of view. No matter how bad a child is, they're still your child. No matter what they do, how much they hurt you, they're still your child. You can be mad at them, you can be hurt at them, you can be angry at them. But when something happens to them, it hurts you because they are hurt. No matter how much they have done to you, they're still your child. Absalom had tried to kill David. He had tried to overthrow him and take the uh, kingship from David. But in spite of that, when Absalom was killed, David mourned. And he mourned greatly. But something else was going on. And this is where Joab... Now, Joab has come in several times already and confronted David and just laid it right on the line with him. And Joab came in and said, David, this is my paraphrase of it. You're not seeing the big picture. You're only thinking about yourself. You're thinking about your hurt, but you're not seeing the big picture. There were hundreds of thousands of people that fought for you. They followed you wherever you went. And they were rejoicing because the battle had been won. You're the king, and you're going to remain the king. But you're up here crying, you're up here mourning, and he says, the people believe that you would have been happier if all of them had been killed trying to protect you, and Absalom was still alive. And you remember in the last verse of that other chapter that David said, oh, if it had only been me instead of you. David didn't see the big picture. He saw the smaller picture that only concerned himself. And I think a lot of times in church we fall into that same attitude, that same trap. When we are doing things in church, how many times do people want something and want it to be a certain way and only that way, but yet they're not looking at the big picture. They're not looking at what's going to help, and they're not looking at what's going to affect other people in a positive way as well. Sometimes we get hurt, and we turn our attention in. We focus on ourselves instead of the bigger picture of what's going on. 
I've gone through this a lot of times with people where they get upset, where they get mad about something and sometimes really, really mad about something. But if they will eventually see the bigger picture, then they begin to understand that they were off track. Now, what they got upset with might have been a kind of legitimate thing. But there's a bigger picture for people to see. We're not a church of individuals. We are the body of Christ. We are one body, not however many's in here tonight, high 90s, 100, whatever may be in here tonight. We're not that many people. We are one body of Christ. And what we got to do as a church is think about what's good for the body. Well, one thing we know is good for the body is to follow the Word of God. And if we are obedient to God's word, if we're doing the things that God has called us to do and God has saved us to do, then we know that we're going to be that one body. Again, if we are doing those things and we're praising God for the results that come because we are working together in unity, working together as a body, each of you using your gifts of the Holy Spirit to accomplish the mission that God has given this church to do, then we will be of one mind and one accord. And that's according to Acts chapter 2, was one of the main things that helped the early church to grow. They were of one mind and one accord. They didn't have all these different agendas. They hadn't been around long enough probably to develop all their own personal agendas. But they were only concerned about people that were lost receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And that would have been most of the people around them. Now, You know, before Jesus came, for the Jews that were living in the Old Testament period, they had to believe and have faith that God was going to send the Messiah. Now for those of us today, we've got to believe and have faith that God has already sent the Messiah and his name was Jesus of Nazareth. But suppose you were living at the time that Jesus was born and the time that Jesus was crucified. Then you might have believed that God was going to send the Messiah, but uh-oh, the Messiah's here. So now it's going from believing that God is going to send the Messiah to here is the Messiah. And faith has to now be put in Him instead of just the fact that God is going to, God has. And it's Jesus from Nazareth. A man that was born of a carpenter, not a king, on this earth, and a man that was crucified, that suffered capital punishment, convicted by the government, and put to death by the government for crimes that he had committed, or that they said he had committed. Now, can you imagine being a person living during that period of time where you've got to go from believing the Messiah is coming to the Messiah is here? He's that guy that was crucified. 
put to death by the government for crimes that they say that he had committed. Well, many thousands of people believed. Many thousands of people accepted. 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, a couple of thousand after that. And then the Bible says, as many were saved daily as would be saved, or such as was being saved. So there were thousands that were saved and many, many more every day that were coming to Jesus Christ. Why would that be? Why would that be? Because the church saw the bigger picture. And as the church went on, and persecution started coming about, Stephen was stoned, and then the Christians started leaving Jerusalem. Not leaving running because they were afraid of the persecution. The persecution drove them out, but they were telling people everywhere they went that Jesus is the Messiah and that eternal life only comes through him. You see, they got their mind off of themselves. They got their eyes off of their circumstances and saw the bigger picture that there is a world that needs to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Churches today need to get their eyes off themselves. And we need to get our eyes off ourselves and say, well, we only do it this way and we only do it that way. He says, as long as we're not doing anything contrary to the Word of God, there's a world of people out there that need to be saved, that need to come to know and receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. Paul said, I become all things to all people in order that some may come to know Jesus. Because he had his eye on the bigger picture. Not that he had been beaten so many times. Not that he had been thrown in jail so many times. Not that he had been shipwrecked. Not that he had been bitten by serpents. Not that any of these things had ever happened. But the bigger picture. There are people out there that need to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And that's the picture that we need to see. Not a picture of just what really makes us feel comfortable here in the church. Now that comfort zone's pretty valuable, isn't it? We don't like to get out of our comfort zone, but I don't hardly believe that God saved any of us to stay stay in a comfort zone. That we are to constantly be spreading out our horizons going further than we've ever gone before, doing more than we've ever done before. Not so that I can get credit or praise, but there are people out there that need to know Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. And that's the church's mission, to lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ and disciple them after they come to receive him as their Lord and Savior. And we can go on with the fellowship, the ministry, and the worship, but if the church is strong in evangelism and strong in discipleship, the worship, the ministry, and the fellowship will follow along. They'll just all fall right into place. Because the more we learn about the Word of God, the more we're going to serve God. The more we learn about the Word of God, the more we're really going to praise God. And the more we learn about the Word of God, the more we're going to want to be together as brothers and sisters. Not only with us, but with others as well. The fellowship. I think that we have a bigger vision here, but I'm not totally sure that we're totally seeing the big, big picture and not just falling into that comfort zone, which is so dangerous to be in. You know, we can say, well, it just feels good. 
in my comfort zone. You know what feels better? Being in the center of God's will. And it's kind of stormy a lot of times in the center of God's will. I love experiencing God and I'm glad that Tom is taking people through experiencing God. But you go through all the realities. God's always at work around you and God uh, seeks a loving relationship or pursues that relationship with you. We invite you to become involved with him in his work. And then there comes one that's called the crisis of belief. I love that. And the next one that comes after it, you've got to make major adjustments to follow God. There comes a crisis of belief. A crisis when we faced a crisis of belief a little over a year ago. When we had this vision that we decided that we needed to follow and see what God was going to do that we could do something really crazy like try and trade our property for this property. After we had been told by the people that were representing the bondholders that there was no way that we could do it, that they were not interested at all. But God provided another company to represent the bondholders. And they were willing to do it. And we're here. But we faced a crisis of belief. Could we, that church that was up in that building, take on a project this big? Now we can look at it right now and everything's pretty good. But there have been way has been way over $300,000 put into getting it this good since we bought it. Getting it back up, getting it running, and making it presentable for the people to come in. Could we do that? And you know what we decided? Basically what we decided? No, but God can So we faced our crisis of belief. Then we had to make major adjustments. And those adjustments have come through work. They have come through giving. Because as I mentioned this morning, we are very close to having paid off 300000 in principle within this year period of time. When you see the bigger picture and you're willing to step out and this church is willing to step out and do whatever we need to do to reach this community and bring more families in, younger families, we need to bring older people in. But it's kind of scary sometimes. I'll just be frankly honest with you tonight. It's kind of scary sometimes when we have so many people in their 90s and 80s and 70s sitting even old anymore. When I was growing up, you were ancient if you ever got to 65. Uh, So many people in that age group, and you look over here, and how many youth, young people, do you see? We don't want to think about it, but we're going to die. And we want Brown Road Baptist Church to keep going. We have got to do some things that's going to start reaching younger families and bringing them in. Whether we kick and scream about it or not, we have got to start doing it. By getting the bigger picture, And not just looking at where am I comfortable. Now, where are you at? 
Are you kind of like David, focused in on yourself? And David had a lot of good reason to be focused in on himself. But he was losing the kingdom because he was so focused on losing a son. He didn't see the bigger picture. If you just, if you got your Bible still there, look at this. In 19.2, so the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard it said that day, the king is grieved for his son. Now look at the next verse, verse 3. And the people stole back into the city that day as people who are ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. They had been rejoicing. They had been celebrating. A great victory had been won. And one person was messing it up for everyone else because he was focused in on his hurt and not what was happening to the rest of the people. They were rejoicing and then they became ashamed of what had happened. Well, David finally saw it because he had someone that would come and tell him and say, David, you've got to get a bigger view of what's going on around you than you've got. And he went out to the people. What I'm saying to Brown Road Baptist Church tonight is we've got to get a big vision. The missions committee is working up this walk through the Bible. And I've told you this before, she scared me to death when she brought it up. So I thought it was way, way, way more than we could do. But you all look at me and say, O oh, ye of little faith. Because it's going to come about. Now what's going to happen, I don't know. We'll see when it happens, but be praying about it. I told you this. One Easter, our choir was doing a cantata. The, our worship leader, who was volunteer, and two or three people in the choir came to me and said, do you mind if we turn our cantata into a play? We'll do it ourselves. I said, if you all can do it, go ahead and do it. Well, it became a major production thing in the church. They extended the stage area out, and there were probably 25, 30 people in the choir, 100 people involved in the production of it. And they asked me, and they said, how many people do you think we're going to have? I said, I have no idea. I was thinking maybe 75 other than the people at church would come to it because small community. And I thought, well, if we have 75, we've probably done pretty good. We have between seven and 800 that one night that showed up for that play. We had never done it before. We had never really advertised anything about it. It's just something that our choir leader, music director, worship leader, whatever you wanted to call him, and three or four people in the choir thought would be a good thing to do, said they had prayed about it, and God really blessed it. And over the years, many people came to know Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. Pray that walk through the Bible will be something like that. That will be an outreach to this community that will show them the love of God and lead them to receiving Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. And other things that may come up as we go along and ideas that people have, pray about them, let me know about them. And we'll pray about it and see if this is something that the church should be doing and church should be involved in. 
so that we can reach this community and bring more families and especially younger families in to the church so Brown Road can go on. I can get in my comfort zone and let it die with me or I can step outside my comfort zone and help bring other people in so that they will have a church to worship and praise God in as well. So if you're here tonight and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you need to do that. And right now is your opportunity to do it, to come and just say, I've never really invited Jesus to come into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. Tonight, I want to do that. Maybe you're here and you're not a member of the church, but you know this is where God wants you to be. And you want to be a part of a church that has a big vision, that sees the bigger picture. And not just of what we are right now, but what God wants us to become as a church. He gave us a larger facility to fill up the larger facility. You want to be a part of that, you come. Father, as we come to you tonight, again, we praise you and glorify you for everything you're doing. I pray that we will get the bigger picture and not just be comfortable with where we're at, but, Father, that we will reach out into this community, expand and grow, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we stand and sing, have thine own way, you come.